Hello and welcome to Noon Conference hosted by MRI Online. In response to the changes happening around the world right now and the shutting down of in-person events, we have decided to provide free noon conferences to all radiologists worldwide. Today we are joined by Dr. Omar Awan. Dr. Awan is a musculoskeletal radiologist with a special interest in education and informatics. A reminder that there will be a Q&A session at the end of the lecture, so please use the Q&A feature to ask your questions, and we will get to as many as we can before our time is up. That being said, thank you all for joining us today. Dr. Awan, I will let you take it from here. All right, can everyone see my screen here? Do I have a thumbs up? Yep, looks okay. good. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much. My name is Omar Awan. I'm a musculoskeletal radiologist here at the University of Maryland in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, it's an honor to be uh, speaking again uh, to MRI Online and welcome to all the audience here. Today, we'll be talking about ACL repair and reconstruction. The ACL repair is a very common, uh, you know, post-operative uh, procedure that a lot of patients encounter. So anyone who reads musculoskeletal MRI, I hope will understand this. So we're gonna go over some normal and abnormal findings uh, with respect to ACL repair. So I like to start all my lectures with certain cases that I, I, I kind of show at the beginning and I come back to at the end. And so this is just for you guys to kind of look at and assess. So this is case number one, this is a sagittal T1 weighted uh, MRI image of a knee and a patient that's had a ACL reconstruction and there's an abnormality here. And my question is, what's the most likely diagnosis? And we'll come back to these at the end, but is it tibial tunnel syndrome, arthrofibrosis, notch impingement syndrome, or an entrapped ACL stump? I'm just gonna come back to the image again. And we're not gonna go over the answers now, but we'll go over them at the very end of the lecture. So this is again, case number one, what's the most likely diagnosis there? Case number two, this is another image through a patient that's had an ACL reconstruction. You can see the interference screws here. Okay, um, there's an obvious abnormality here on the coronal and sagittal T2 fat sat weighted images through the knee. And the question I have, there's no multiple choice here, but the question I have is where would you expect there to be bone marrow edema in the knee and in what locations based on the finding that you're seeing here? So based on the finding that you're seeing here in this patient status of ACL reconstruction, where would you expect to see the bone marrow edema in this patient? Okay, uh, question number three, this is a patient that's had an ACL repair, as you can see with the interference screws. And there is an abnormality here. We have AP and lateral radiographs of the knee. And what's wrong with the positioning of the graft? Okay, so there's something wrong with the positioning of the graft. Is it that the femoral graft is too far posterior? Is the femoral graft too far anterior? Is the tibial graft too far posterior? Or is the tibial graft too far anterior? And I just wanna show you the images again to assess what you think the answer is here. Okay, in case four, this is the last case I'm gonna show. <clears throat> we have a sagittal, um, I, I believe this is a sagittal T2 weighted image. Um, it's not fat sat, but sagittal T2 weighted image through the knee in a patient that's had an ACL graft and there is a finding and an abnormality here. And what's the complication that I'm showing you on this image? What's the complication we're showing on this image here? <clears throat> All right. So let's get started. We're going to come back to all four of those cases at the very end. What I want to do today is to, uh, to delineate the various types of ACL grafts that we use and their imaging appearance, their normal imaging appearance. We're going to describe the normal post-operative appearance of ACL reconstruction because I think it's important to understand what normal is before we can talk about what abnormal is. And then we're going to characterize the imaging finding of ACL graft complications into three basic categories, okay, based on, you know, the clinical uh, symptomatology associated with, the, with, the, with ACL repair, okay? So first we're gonna talk about the types of graphs. So there are many types of graphs, okay? And, the, and they continue to evolve with time. Um, we're gonna talk about two graphs today in today's lecture. We're gonna talk about the bone patellar tendon bone graft and the four strand hemi, hamstring graft that is done with the semi tendinosis and the gracilis tendons, okay? Um, those make up the vast majority of graphs that we see in, um, in practice today. There are other synthetic type of graphs and by the way, these are the two that I'm discussing are autologous grafts. There are also cadaveric grafts that are used in clinical practice. Um, um, there are many other type of grafts that occur, okay? There are donor grafts that occur from other individuals like family members, but we're gonna talk about autologous 
um, bone patellar tendon bone grafts and four stranded hamstring grafts. Okay. Um, there are also double bundle grafts that use both the anterior medial and the posterior lateral bundles of the ACL. So remember that the um, hopefully you guys can hear me. The, the, the point I was just trying to say was that um, the bone patellar tendon bone graft and the four string, four strand hamstring graft only use the anterior medial bundle to repair the graft. So, you know, now there are more anatomic double bundle grafts that repair both the AM and the PL, PL bundles. Okay. All right. Very good. So the bone patellar tendon bone graft has, um, and the four hamstring graft are the most common as we, as we talked about, right? So the way they do the bone patellar tendon bone graft is they literally um, take part of the patellar, part of the patellar tubal tubercle, and they take the central third of the patellar tendon and they use that as the bone patellar tendon bone graft. Um, the hamstring graft is done by the distal aspect of the semitendinosus and gracilis um, tendon that are um, used for the myotendinous junction to its insertion on the tibial tubercle, and then is braided back onto itself. So that's why it becomes like four strands. So you have two two tendons, the semitendinosus and the gracilis, that are then um, braided back onto itself. Okay, this is just like a nice image or a cartoon of what the bone patellar tendon bone graft looks like. You have bone plug here from the patellar tibial tubercle, and you have the central third of the patellar tendon that's used as the ACL graft. And the four stranded hamstring graft is again the four strands because you have the semi tendinosus and the gracilis that are then, you know, braided back onto itself, creating four grafts. And you can see the interference screws here fixating the four stranded hamstring graft. Now, in terms of the imaging of the graft itself, um, the graft is normally low in signal on T1, but it can have areas of intermediate and even high signal, um, particularly four months to eight months post-op, up to a year, but really between four months and eight months due to revascularization and synovialization where the graft is being incorporated into the body, essentially. The four-strand hamstring graft can also have increased linear signal between the strands, between the strands of the graft, because there's four different strands. Now, obviously, you would not expect there to be linear signal between any strands in the bone patellar tendon bone graft because it's a single strand itself, right? So that's one difference that you can see in the imaging of the graft itself. So for example, this is a sagittal T2 weighted uh, fat side image through the uh, knee. And you can see there's some linear increased signal here. This is between the strands of the four strands of a hamstring tendon graft, okay? So this is normal. This is not you wouldn't call this a partial tear. This is just a normal appearance. Now, if you had signal that was going perpendicular to this ACL, then that would of course be a partial tear or a complete tear, okay? But, you know, linear signal going along the course of the strands is not abnormal and can be, can persist post-op really from the, for the remained, for the uh, entire life of the graft. Okay, the normal post-operative appearance, I wanna talk about that because I think that's important. The position and the alignment of the graft is crucial for the stability um, of the graft and also for good clinical outcomes. So we have the femoral tunnel position, which we're gonna talk about in a second, and the tibial tunnel position. And the both of them are very important. The femoral tunnel position maintains the graft isometry. It makes sure that the graft is not gonna stretch tear and have laxity associated with it, okay? The tibial tunnel position is important because it prevents impingement of the graft. And the impingement, which we're gonna talk about later on, can lead to various complications associated with the graft, okay? So that's very important when we discuss um, ACL reconstruction. So very important to understand that the positioning becomes very important in terms of the femoral tunnel and the tibial tunnel. Now on an X-ray, you can you can assess the positioning either on an X-ray or a coronal and sagittal image of the knee on, on an MRI. Now I'm going to draw two lines here, which I think are very important. The this vertical line here is is a line along the posterior aspect of the femoral cortex, and this oblique line is along the roof of the intercondylar notch. It's going along the you know the intercondylar notch. Where these two lines intersect is where the inferior aspect of the femoral tunnel should be. That's ideally where the inferior aspect of the tunnel should be, okay? So that's where the femoral tunnel should be situated. Notice that the tibial tunnel right here lies just posterior to the intercondylar notch, and that's exactly where it should be, okay? So that's really where the normal position should be on a lateral view of the x-ray. Now the femoral tunnel, if you were to look at this on a frontal or an AP view of the knee, 
the femoral tunnel should really be at the 11 o'clock position in the right knee, and it would be along the one o'clock position if we were doing a left knee. Okay, so the side does make a difference, obviously, right? Um, because of where you know the the femoral, you know, where the ACL is inserting. So it's going to be about 10 or 11 o'clock on the right, one or two o'clock on the left on an AP view, and the same is true for a coronal image uh, through through the knee on an MRI study. So again, the graph should really parallel Blumen's Blumen's ass line is this line or the slope of the intercondylar notch, right? On the lateral X-ray or a sagittal view through the spine. It's, it's indicated by this yellow line right here. So notice that the graft is gonna be parallel to Blumen's ass line just posterior to it, right? So that's the way the uh, that's the way the orientation should be. Now, if this if the if the graft becomes too vertical, then that becomes a problem, right? That means that there could be some impingement or some other abnormalities associated with it, right? So um, you want to make sure that the that the graft is you know perpendicular to Blumenstadt's line. That that's that's important. And again, the tibial opening of the tunnel should be just posterior to the intercondylar notch, as it is in this case, in this normal case here. Okay. Now, in terms of the appearance, I, I alluded to this a little earlier, but the graft can show increased signal on T2 for the life of the graft, actually. There can be areas of T2 hypertense signal that persist for the life of the graft, and that's a normal postoperative finding. Now, within the tunnel itself, remember, the graft is situated in the, in the tibial and the femoral tunnel. There can be fluid in there, but that should only last for about a year and a half. After a year and a half, we shouldn't see fluid in the tunnel that holds the graft, that holds the femoral that holds the ACL graft itself, okay? There's a femoral tunnel and there's a tibial tunnel. Marrow edema in the bone is also a normal postoperative finding, but only for about three or four months. After four months, we would expect the marrow edema in the bone to resolve, okay? So those are the important things I think um, one should consider when you're looking at this. So, you know, the graft itself can have increased signal through the life of the graft, Increased signal in the tunnel can last for about a year and a half, and then within the bone for about three or four months. Now we're going to talk about the different complications associated with ACL graft, okay? ACL graft repair. And I think it's important, it's, it's, it's helpful to discuss this and break them down into three basic categories based on clinical symptomatology. So, you know, sometimes patients complain of decreased range of motion and like, you know, inability to extend the knee. There are certain, uh, uh, complications that are associated with decreased range of motion. There are certain complications associated with laxity of the graft clinically. And then there are certain other complications that don't really fit well with those other two clinical scenarios, which are listed there. So for example, decreased range of motion, we're talking about things like arthrofibrosis, internal notch impingement, loose bodies, ganglion cyst, tibial tunnel syndrome, entrapped ACL stump. Those are all associated with decreased range of motion. Laxity refers to frank tearing or stretching of the graft. That's what we mean when we talk about laxity. And then miscellaneous things are things that are you know much less common, like mucoid degeneration, hardware complication, septic arthritis, iliotibial band friction syndrome. Those don't fit in with decreased range of motion and laxity. And that's so we're going to talk about all of these based on um, the clinical symptomatology. We're going to start with decreased range of motion. Okay, and we're going to talk about you know four or five entities related to decreased range of motion starting with internal impingement, or also known as notch impingement, okay? Impingement that occurs at the level of the intercondylar notch. This is usually due to an abnormal tibial position of the graft when the tibial tunnel is placed too far anteriorly. Remember, the tibial tunnel should open just posterior to the intercondylar notch, but if it's too far anterior, it's gonna impinge that graft onto the intercondylar notch. And as you can imagine, if that if that tunnel is, or that graft is too far anteriorly, it's gonna rub against the intercondylar notch. And with time, it's gonna stretch that graft and lead to abnormal signal in that graft. And it might quite frankly, tear that graft, okay? Um, it may tear that graft. So that's an important, uh, that's an important uh, finding, okay? It's treated with notch plasty, meaning they, you know, arthroscopically resect part of the intercondylar notch. So this is a cartoon just showing, you know, the ACL reconstruction, how it's placed too far anteriorly. It's rubbing against the intercondylar notch and notice that it's stretching this ACL graft. It's it's becoming inflamed. Okay, it can, it can actually even quite frankly tear the graft with time, okay? Um, this is a nice example of internal impingement where notice that there's like an osteophyte here along the intercondylar notch, right? So this osteophyte is exerting mass effect on this graft and there's some posterior bowing as a result, 
because of this internal impingement. So pretty much when the graft is placed too far anteriorly, it can rub against the intracondylar notch or there can be an osteophyte. Sometimes it's not placed too far anteriorly. There can be an osteophyte along the intracondylar notch that then impinges the graft itself, okay? And then again, this can lead to laxity and tearing and stretching of the graft with time. Arthrofibrosis is another, or a cyclops lesion is another uh, um, complication that can occur secondary to decreased range of motion. This limits the terminal extension of the knee. And there can be a focal form known as a cyclops lesion or a diffuse form of arthrofibrosis. And the key imaging finding for this is that these, these deposits that occur anteriorly tend to be low or intermediate on both T1 and T2 weighted MRI images, okay? So for example, it's just a, it's like an area of, you know, lobulated area of decreased signal that occurs, you know, kind of anterior to the graft um, and tends to be low on both T1 and T2 weight images. And because this arthrofib or this cyclops lesion or arthrofibrosis can result in pain and it can result in inability to terminally extend the knee. Okay, so decreased range of motion. It's known as a cyclops lesion because arthroscopically it represents the, uh, it resembles, you know, the appearance of a face with a discolored eye, okay? A discolored, you know, kind of bluish, hueish eye, right? So that's why it, uh, it's called a cyclops lesion when it is focal. It can be diffuse and it can involve the entire joint capsule as well. It can involve Hoffa's fat pad. It can involve the posterior joint capsule. Um, but we see more commonly the cyclops lesion or the focal form of arthrofibrosis in clinical practice. And again, the key is the low signal on both T1 and T2 weighted images. Loose bodies can also occur and result in decreased range of motion. These can result from the initial trauma that occurred that result in the ACL uh, tear. Um, and you can have osteochondral bodies that get, you know, that can kind of, kind of float within the joint capsule and they can become entrapped in the joint and result in decreased range of motion um, as the patient moves their knee. Okay, they can be cartilaginous, they can be osseous, they can be osteocartilaginous, okay? Their signal characteristics will vary based on their amount of cartilage or cortical bone or cancellous bone that, that make up the osteochondral bodies, right? So they're gonna be intermediate to low signal on T2. Now, if they're all cortical bone, it's gonna be very low signal on both T1 and T2 because it's gonna be, you know, cortical bone, which is, which is low, which is devoid of signal on MRI, okay? So this is just a nice example of a plain film showing an osteochondral body, <clears throat> excuse me, that can result in decreased range of motion on the, on the MR. Notice that it's following the signal characteristics of bone, right? Of the medullary bone here and with a little bit of cortical bone as well, right? There's peripheral cortical bone, which is dark. And then there's fatty marrow bone, which is, you know, the, the cancellous bone here, right? Or the trabecular bone, right? This is an osteo, this is a loose body that may result in decreased range of motion in this patient. Ganglion cyst or tibial tunnel syndrome refers to cystic degeneration of the graft where you get, you know, T2 hyperintense, you know, cystic uh, signal within the, within, the, within the tunnel, okay? Um, it can include it in the tibial tunnel or the femoral tunnel, more commonly in the tibial tunnel. Um, this is usually a later complication. Remember that um, usually happens two or three years after ACL graft reconstruction. Um, usually it, it stays confined to the tibial tunnel, but it can actually extend and ex exude out of the tunnel into the joint space and into the soft tissues, right? So it can actually look quite aggressive, but that's rare. Um, but, you know, a ganglion cyst or a tibial tunnel syndrome is, 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 is common. Here you see a ganglion cyst associated with the femoral and the tibial tunnel. Okay, this can result in pain, decreased range of motion, okay? Um, so this is another... Uh, common uh, complication associated with decreased range of motion. The last complication I'm gonna talk about with respect to decreased range of motion is an entrapped ACL stump. So sometimes the entire torn, you know, ACL doesn't get removed surgically. And sometimes the distal remains of the ACL becomes entrapped between the lateral femoral condyle and the lateral tibia. So th that's known as an entrapped ACL stump. And that can result of course in decreased range of motion because you have, you have tissue that shouldn't be there or should have been removed that remains in the joint or the joint capsule. And an entrapped ACL stump is usually more linear than arthrofibrosis, which is more lobular and circular, right? And it usually maintains its attachment to the ACL. So that's another way we can, uh, we can, we can look at that. So you may be tempted to think that this is a, an, an, a cyclops lesion or, or a form of arthrofibrosis because it's low in signal on this sagittal T2 weighted image, fat sided image through the knee, but notice that it's more linear and it's maintaining its attachment to 
the ACL graft or the tibial eminence here, right? So that's the key here. That's why we know that this is an entrapped ACL. And the fibers, it looks like it's fibrillar, right? It looks like a tendon, right? So that's why there's another uh, reason why this is an entrapped ACL stem and not an example of a cyclops lesion or a focal form of arthrofibrosis. Moving on to laxity. So laxity is related to tearing of the of the of the tendon or the graft, excuse me, or you know, stretching of the of the of the graft. This commonly occurs earlier on. This is not like tibial tunnel syndrome or ganglion cysts that occurs years later. This happens usually during synovialization or revascularization of the graft that typically occurs four to eight months after the surgery. Okay. Um, this is usually due to the fact that the femoral tunnel is placed too far anteriorly. So remember, when the tibial tunnel is placed too far anteriorly, that leads to impingement. When the femoral tunnel is placed too far anteriorly, this can lead to laxity and tearing of the graft. So we're looking for fiber discontinuity, increased T2 signal within the graft that's perpendicular to the graft. Anterior tibial translation of more than seven millimeters is a secondary sign. You know, uncovering of the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus would be another secondary sign. Marrow edema, like as seen in like a pivot shift injury along the anterior lateral femoral condyle and posterior lateral tibial plateau would be another secondary sign for an for a graft tear. That was one of the questions that I had asked, if you remember, at the at the at the beginning of my lecture. When you have marrow edema along the anterior lateral femoral condyle or posterior lateral tibial plateau, that can be a sign of a pivot shift mechanism of injury, and that can be a sign that the graft is ruptured. Okay. So this was the case that I showed. Notice that there's marrow edema here along the anterior as or lateral aspect of the femoral condyle. Um, and there's frank tearing of the graft here, right? We have complete discontinuity of the fibers of the ACL graft here, okay? There's obviously a large superpatellar effusion, posterior soft tissue edema, but the major finding is the tearing of the ACL graft here. Again, if the femoral tunnel, again, is placed too far anteriorly, as I described, that can result in strain when the knee is flexed, okay? That can result in strain when the knee is flexed and that can result to laxity and tearing. Now, what does laxity look like or stretching look like on an MR? The fibers are usually intact, but there can be bowing of the graft. So usually the, 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 the graft is bowed posteriorly. There's posterior bowing of the graft, um, which results in stretching. It's not, it doesn't have that straight caliber, you know, that's parallel to Blumenstadt's line. Um, this is a nice example of how the femoral graft has been placed too far anteriorly. Remember, it should be kind of be right here, but it's placed too far anteriorly and you have an ACL graft. This is actually more than stretching. I think this is actually frank rupture of the graft, okay? So although this can lead to stretching, this is actually frank rupture of the graft itself. All right, moving on to miscellaneous complications, okay? Miscellaneous complications are the ones that we see, you know, you know, some of them are unique to ACL like mucodegeneration, but the other ones are, you know, like septic arthritis, you know, hardware complications, those are seen in, are, are seen in really any post-operative, you know, findings or post-operative complications of, you know, anytime you put orthopedic hardware within a joint or along bones, right? So mucodegeneration is, is something that we see in native ACLs, but also in uh, ACL grafts, right? It doesn't necessarily indicate failure of the graft. You can have mucodegeneration without increased um, predisposition to having, you know, laxity or even tearing of the graft. This is when we see thickening um, or, you know, T2 hyperintense signal within the substance of the graft that doesn't disrupt the fibers. It does not disrupt the fibers. It's just kind of thickening of the graft or, you know, you know, T2 hyperintense signal without disruption of the fibers. And this is a nice example of that where you have increased signal within the graft, maybe a little bit of thickening, but we can actually see, you know, the fibers of the graft itself that are, you know, oriented normally, um, you know, parallel to Blumenstadt's line and are, and are running very nicely here, okay? So a nice appearance of mucoid degeneration. You can have fractured screws, right? So this is a, a vertical line indicating a fractured bioabsorbable bio screw on an MRI. Um, ACL repairs can be repaired by a various various mechanisms, so usually interference screws. Um, and, you, you know, the, the patellar tendon, bone patellar tendon, bone graft is always fixated with, you know, interference screws, but the four strand hamstring graft can be fixated with um, interference screws, but they can also be fixated with endo buttons, cross pins, you know, there's a multiple variety of ways that, you know, the four branded um, hamstring graft can be associated. Here we have a fracture of the bioservable screw right here on MRI. Um, 
this was one of the cases that I showed earlier on in my lecture, one of the cases. This is a this is actually a rare complication. This is a femoral blowout fracture, okay? So notice that the that the femoral instead of being placed too far anteriorly, the femoral uh, pin or the tunnel is placed too far posteriorly and it's fractured the posterior cortex. You can see that there's a fracture of the posterior cortex of the femur here. This is known as a femoral blowout fracture. This was much more common 30, 40 years ago when orthopedic surgeons were putting them this way. We now know and they know not to do that. And that's why they put it a little bit more anteriorly and not abutting the cortex, right? Be to, to prevent this complication. So orthopedic surgeons are doing a much better job preventing this. And we rarely see this complication now in modern clinical practice, but this was a complication that was definitely present, you know, in the, in the late 1990s, 1980s, but, you know, you know, starting with the 21st century, we, we rarely see this complication anymore, but this is a nice example of what a femoral blowout fracture would be when you put the femoral tunnel too far posteriorly. Okay, and this was an index case that I showed earlier on at the beginning of my lecture. So iliotibial band friction syndrome can occur with a hamstring graft. This is due to contact of the dislodged or fragmented cross pins with the hamstring graft, okay? So iliotibial band friction syndrome, as we know, you know, with native knees is when you have thickening of the iliotibial band or if you have, you have edema between the iliotibial band and the lateral femoral condyle, but when, where the iliotibial band inserts onto Jordy's tubercle on the proximal anterior lateral tibia, okay? Infection and septic arthritis is obviously a complication of any orthopedic procedure. It's rare with ACL grass. We don't see it too often, you know, less than 1% of cases, but we would typically look for effusions, synovitis, osteomyelitis, you know, synovial hypertrophy, synovial inflammation, erosive changes along the bones, soft tissue abscesses. All of these could be associated with, you know, infection and septic arthritis, okay? Um, so do those were, you know, I wanted to do this very quickly and very briefly because I want to have time for questions. Um, these were the ranges of ACL complications. Again, um, you know, I divide, I like, I think it's helpful to divide them from a clinical perspective in terms of decreased range of motion, um, laxity, and then miscellaneous complications. The decreased range of motions reflect internal impingement, arthrofibrosis, loose bodies, tibial tunnel syndrome, and entrapped ACL stump. Laxity really refers to rupture or stretching of the graft, and that's when the femoral tunnel is placed too far anteriorly. Miscellaneous complications are mucoid degeneration, hardware complication, improper graft placement, iliotibial band friction syndrome, and septic arthritis. I want to come back to the cases, and I want to see if people know the answers to these cases. Maybe you can type in your answers in the Q&A box here. Um, so... Let's see here. So what's the what's the complication that I'm showing you here on this T1 weighted image? Is it tibial tunnel syndrome, arthrofibrosis, notch impingement, or entrapped ACL stump? Is it A, B, C, or D? Let's see what people are saying. So people are saying complete tear, rupture, complete tear. Okay, that's not even one of the choices, guys. So um, most people are saying B, some D, some C. Okay. Most people are saying B, and that's the correct answer here. The correct answer here is arthrofibrosis, right? So um, remember, there's, there's a, a nodule, a soft tissue nodule here. It's predominantly low signal intensity. It's anterior to the ACL, right? I didn't show you a T2. That would have also been low. But this is a nice example of what a cyclops, cyclops lesion or, or a focal form of arthrofibrosis would look like. Okay, so this is a nice example of arthrofibrosis. All right, this is a patient that has status post ACL repair. There's bone marrow edema here. There's complete rupture of the graft, right? So where would we expect the bone marrow edema to be? In what locations would we expect the bone marrow edema to be? Okay, someone said anterior lateral femur. Okay, anywhere else in the pivot shift, in the area of pivot shift, which is correct. Okay, good. Exactly, oasis, correct. Anterior lateral femoral condyle and posterior lateral tibial plateau or tibial condyle. That's exactly right. Okay, um, good. So that's exactly right. The anterior lateral femoral condyle, posterior lateral tibial plateau are where we'd expect the bone marrow edema pattern to be, okay? Very good, excellent. Anterior lateral femoral, and that's exactly the pivot shift mechanism even in native knees that have ACL tears. All right, case number three. This is a patient that satisfies ACL reconstruction. We see an abnormality here on the lateral view, 
what's wrong with the positioning of the graft? Is a femoral graft too far posterior? Is a femoral graft too far anterior? Is a tibial graft too far posterior? Or is a tibial graft too far anterior? Okay, most people are saying A, too far posterior. Okay. Let's see in the QA, I think it's probably the same thing. All right, good, excellent. All right, that's in fact the answer. It's too far posterior. This is a femoral blowout fracture, right? So <clears throat> it's a uh, it's placed too far posteriorly. It should be kind of maybe one or two centimeters more anteriorly, and it's resulted in fracturing of the posterior cortex of the femoral distal femoral metaphyseal cortex, right? So this is a femoral blowout fracture. Okay. The last case I wanted to show was this case. It's a sagittal T2 weighted image through a patient that's had an ACL reconstruction. What's the complication that we're seeing here? What complication am I showing you on the sagittal T2 weighted image? Okay, so Dr. Joshi says ganglion cyst in the tibial tunnel. Okay, avulsion of the tibial screw. That's what Hussam thinks. Synovial cyst, ganglion infiltration of the graft, cystic degeneration. Okay, all right. So most people are correct here. Okay, this is you know you know tibial tunnel syndrome or ganglion cyst, you know cystic degeneration, whatever you want to call it. Notice that the you know it's just focal fusiform, you know T2 cystic focus within the graft itself. Okay, the fibers of the graft are not torn. Okay, so this is tibial tunnel syndrome or a ganglion cyst. Excellent job, guys. All right, so I hope what we did today, okay, this was very short, but I wanted to keep it as short because I don't want to keep talking. I want to have opportunity to answer questions. So we talked about the various types of ACL graphs and their imaging appearance, okay? We talked about, you know, we talked mainly about the bone, patellar tendon bone graft. We talked about the normal post-operative appearance of ACL reconstruction, right? What it looks like normally and, you know, post-operative, what, what, what the abnormalities are. And we talked about the different findings of the ACL graft complications, you know, with three basic categories, decreased range of motion, laxity, and then miscellaneous findings, okay? These are the references that I used, um, you know, from AJR, Radiographics, and StatDX. Please take a look at these references. Um, I do have a YouTube channel. It's called Omar Awan Rad Education. Please take a look at this. Um, there's a lot of free videos, lectures, cases, and content there that you can all benefit from. So it's called Umar Awan Rad Education. Please subscribe to my channel. It'd be great if you guys subscribed. Um, thank you so much. This is the QR code to one of the AJR articles that, that I referenced that goes over a lot of the things that I talked about today. So if you, if you aim your iPhone camera to that QR code, it'll take you to that article that I'm talking about. And I took actually a lot of some of the images that I took are from that AJR article as well. So if you, this is the QR code for that, uh, for that article there. And my email is right here. Please feel free to email me with questions, but I'm happy to take questions now as well. Thank you so much for your, for your time and attention. Yeah, it does look like we have a few questions in the Q and A function right now. Okay. I guess why don't I just go to the top? Yeah, I think I am at the top here. Um, okay, so what complication do you see most often? So, so William Morse is asking that question. The complications that I see are um, tearing of the graft, okay? I see notch impingement very often, okay? Impingement of the graft because the tibial tunnel is placed too far anterior. I see an osteophyte at the intercondylar notch. And then I also see from time to time a cyclops lesion, okay? But I would say tearing of the graft and impingement are the two or more common ones that I see in clinical practice, okay? An anonymous attendee said, infectious changes versus early post-op changes. How can you be more confident? Okay, all right, that's a good question. Okay, now, post-op changes are really related to the marrow, right? Like, like bone marrow edema, right? Uh, for three to four months, maybe some increased fluid in the graft, increased signal within the tunnel, right? Infection is going to result in soft tissue changes like subcutaneous edema. There may be an abscess, right? There may be myositis. Um, there may be inflammation in the synovium, right? Those are all findings that may lead you to think that there's infection superimposed, okay? Um, so I look for soft tissue findings and other, you know, ancillary findings to suggest infection uh, 
versus just early post-op changes. That's how I do it. Okay. How important is it to be able to identify between a complete tear versus an almost complete graft tear when you are not sure if a few bands are still intact? Okay. It's important, but it's not the end of the world. Okay. Because the bottom line is you want to talk about if it's torn or not and whether it's a partial tear or there's, there's no tear, right? Once you identify that there's a partial tear, I would also suggest maybe talking about whether it's a high grade tear or a low grade tear. Okay. So if only a few fibers are intact and that's probably a high grade partial tear and maybe the orthopedic surgeon will likely have to do something about it if it's a really low grade meaning you only see one focal area of increased signal somewhere and depending on the patient's clinical symptoms how lax they are when the knee is flexed or extended then the orthopedic surgeon can maybe decide whether they want to do conservative things or they want to operate again so i would just be as descriptive as possible in the way you describe the tear um, it's not the end of the world if you can't decipher if it's complete or partial tear is the objective testing for mucoid, is there objective testing for mucoid degeneration? Honestly, not that I'm aware of Murray Solomon. Um, that's, a, that's a good question, Murray. Um, I don't know that there's any objective considerations for mucoid degeneration. You know, most of the way I look at it is very subjective. I look to see if there's, you know, fusiform thickening of that with increased signal with, with, with intact fibers, right? And usually mucoid degeneration is, is a form of degeneration that occurs with time, right? So obviously we're not gonna call mucoid degeneration instantly. It's gonna take time and years for that to develop. Um, but I just look for intact fibers and bright signal that's not disrupting the, the, the integrity of the fibers, okay? Meniscal tear common with graft tear similar to native ACL tear? Not necessarily, uh, Dr. Joshi, not necessarily. So, you know, typically, you know, I think we see, I don't have data to prove that to you empirically, quite frankly, but in my experience, I don't see as many meniscal tears associated with grafts compared to, you know, native ACL tears. You know, we know that, you know, native ACL tears are associated with, you know, sometimes medial or lateral meniscal tears. How to differentiate partial tear from mucoid degeneration? And is mucoid degeneration a sign of, okay, so a mucoid degeneration is not a sign of an impending tear away. So I want that to be clear. A mucoid degeneration does not really, has not been associated with, you know, impending tears, but to differentiate them can be very tough, right? But usually again, partial tears will be oriented perpendicular to the graft, right? Whereas mucoid degeneration will have signal that's oriented along the axis of the graph. I think that's how you can tell the difference. Okay. How often do you see ACL non-operated? Well, if there's a partial tear, it's sometimes non-operated. If it's not an elite athlete and if the patient is older and can function normally without it, then we don't operate on it, right? Chronic tears often don't get operated as well, right? So chronic tears tend not to get operated on, okay? But obviously acute, complete tears in elite athletes get operated on, okay? How does a stretched ACL look like? Okay, well, usually there's gonna be bowing of the ACL, usually posteriorly. When you have like a posterior bulge or a posterior contour to the ACL, that can, that, that's what a stretched ACL can look like, okay? Do you mention post-operative reticular linear fibrotic changes in the Hoffa's fat pad as arthrofibrosis, or do you only report it as arthrofibrosis if there's nodular form? Okay, I really only report if it's nodular, okay, within, you know, Hoffa's fat pad or just anterior to the graft. You can, linear fibrotic changes in Hoffa's fat pad is normal. That's a normal post-operative finding on anyone that's had arthroscopy. So I, I would never report that as arthrofibrosis. I would only report if it's nodular, low on T1 and T2. Does mucoid degeneration have a celery stalk appearance? I haven't heard that terminology used before, but I guess that's technically true. Um, it can look like that, Alan, to some extent. I haven't encountered much bioreserval screws in my practice. Can you tell us more about what it should look like in the acute and chronic setting? I mean, I can't tell you that much more about it because I don't see it that much either, but they are definitely present. Um, I've seen bioreserval screws in my practice. Um, they are gonna have susceptibility, obviously. So they're hard to image on MR, right? Any of these screws are gonna be hard to image because they have susceptibility on MRI, right? So usually you need a plain film to, or you need to read the <coughs> surgical history in, a, in the electronic medical record to assess whether, you know, what type of screws are you using, whether it's interference screws, bioserval screws, cross spins, et cetera. Any other questions that I can entertain currently for the group? This was a short lecture, but hopefully it was clear and succinct.
Well, if there are no more questions, I think we can uh, wrap this up for the day. Um, and as we bring this to a close, I want to thank Dr. Awan for this lecture. And thanks to all of you for participating in our noon conference. A reminder that this conference will be available on demand on MRIOnline.com in addition to all previous noon conferences. Be sure to join us again on Wednesday for a lecture from Dr. Hatice Sabas on cystic lung disease. You can register for that at MRIOnline.com and follow us on social media at the MRI online for updates and reminders on upcoming noon conferences. Thanks again and have a great day.